hey there, Chris Clements again with another podcast. I had to redo this one because it was a little messed up on the internet. So we are going to look at isotope formulae, quantum numbers, electron configurations, and orbital diagrams, which will kind of tell like electron configurations. It's pretty tough stuff, so just prepare yourself for some abstract stuff. Okie dokie. Alrighty, let's start with a formulae of isotopes. When you look at a formula of an isotope, you are getting information about that particular isotope. So your first question should be, what's an isotope? Well, one isotope of an element will differ from another isotope of an element if that isotope is the same element, same number of protons is what that means, but differing numbers of neutrons. So as we think about the way an atom is comprised, we have protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and we have electrons in the electron cloud around the nucleus. So what we're talking about here is, for example, carbon. Carbon exists with two naturally occurring isotopes, carbon-12 and carbon-13. The 12 and the 13 are called mass numbers. Those mass numbers are the sums of protons and neutrons that are in the nuclei of those atoms. So, when I give a formula for carbon-12, I will give its mass number and I will give its atomic number in a proper arrangement, as you'll see in just a moment. Again, mass number is the sum of protons and neutrons, and it will be written as a subscript, excuse me, pardon me, as a superscript to the left. So it will be to the upper left of the symbol of the element. The other number that we see in an isotope formula is the atomic number. The atomic number for a particular isotope that has not become an ion, and you don't necessarily understand that right now, but trust me, I'm not gonna mess with you on this, is always equal to the number of protons which is always equal to the number of electrons. Again, unless it has become an ion, but I will not mess with you on that. So our atomic number is written as a subscript to the left, so it's to the lower left side of the atomic symbol. So if you look at this slide, you see a generic symbol, X. There is no element whose symbol is X, by the way. And the mass number would be a superscript to the left. The atomic number would be a subscript to the left. As I mentioned, carbon has two naturally occurring isotopes. They're carbon-12 and carbon-13. We represent their isotope formulae as you see on this screen. So carbon-12 has a mass number of 12, but it's carbon, so we look on the periodic table and we know its atomic number is 6. Carbon-13 has a mass number of 13, but we know it's carbon, and its atomic number is again 6. The information we can gather from an isotope formula is the number of protons and the number of neutrons that are present within the nucleus. So if I ask you on this slide to give the isotope formula for each of the following, hydrogen with two neutrons, fluorine with nine neutrons, and uranium with 143 neutrons, you can advance to the slide that has the answers on this once you do that, please. And if you stop the podcast, written those formulas down, come back to it, you should have what you see on this particular slide. H, mass number of three, atomic number of one. Fluorine is F, not FL, remember, with a mass number of 18 and atomic number of nine. And uranium, U, with a mass number of 235 and an atomic number of 92. So you see what you did was looked up the element on the periodic table, found the number of protons according to its atomic number on the periodic table, and added that to the number of neutrons. That gave you the mass number. Okay, what we're going to start to get into now is where it gets a little abstract. We're going to talk about electrons and what we know about them and where they live. Every atom has at least one electron. Hydrogen has one, helium has two, lithium has three, and so on. When we start to talk about bonding, as we will in chemistry, we tend to focus upon what are known as valence electron or electrons. So you need to know what I'm talking about when I reference valence electrons. Those electrons are the farthest from the nucleus 
they're in what is known as the outermost energy level. So that means we kind of think of this as the Bohr model of an atom, where we have these quantized energy levels. Think of it as rings around the nucleus, solar system model. It's the easiest way to envision what we're going to be talking about. It's not the most accurate method of describing where electrons live, but it's probably the easiest for you to envision. I'm going to go over several principles and rules. The first of them is Aufbau principle. It means to build in German. What it tells us is that electrons will occupy lower energy orbitals first. As they occupy those lower energy orbitals, they are achieving lower energy states. And that translates into stability for the atom. The next principle is the Pauli exclusion principle. It has two components. One is that an atomic orbital can hold at most two electrons. Now, an atomic orbital I want you to think of as kind of the house in which electrons will reside. The second part of it is that if there's an atomic orbital that happens to hold two electrons, then those two electrons have to have opposite spins. And the third rule here is Hund's rule. It's one that's really bizarre until we get into this abstract work. And it tells us that when filling atomic orbitals of equal energy, again, that specifies equal energy orbitals, we will place electrons with parallel spins in the orbitals first, and then we will place oppositely spinning electrons in the orbitals. What we're going to start with is a very difficult concept known as quantum numbers. I want you to think of it as a language of describing the location of electrons that is similar to describing your address with only numbers. Meaning, if you tell me that you live in Louisiana, that you live in Shreveport, that you live on Apple Street at house number four, that is how we typically would give addresses, getting more and more specific as I describe that. Well, we're going to use numbers to describe. So that would mean, for example, if Louisiana were assigned number 18, I don't even remember what state Louisiana was in the Union, I'm sure you all know that. If it were assigned, say, number 18, then we would say we live in 18. If Shreveport were assigned number 2, we would say we live in 18 and then 2. If Apple Street were Street 1, then we live in 18, 2, 1. And if the house number, what did I say it was? I think I said it was 4. That's the only one of those that was a number, so we'd say 4. And that means we would have to understand that 18, 2, 1, 4 describes exactly where you live. Well, what we're going to do is describe where electrons have a tendency to live using four sets of num a set of four numbers rather. These are called quantum numbers. Every electron of every atom has its own set of four quantum numbers to describe where it has a tendency to live. The most general of the quantum numbers is called the principal quantum number. It is abbreviated by a lowercase n. The N describes the energy level in which the electron lives. Okay, so it's the most, uh, I'd say, general description of where an electron lives. It's saying relative to the nucleus how far away it is. N can be any positive integer, which means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. If N is 1, it's as close to the nucleus as it can get. If N were 7, it's as far away from the nucleus as any electron lives. We can get higher than 7, but that's known as an excited state. It's actually what happens when you flame test. So for those of you in my class, when you flame tested the cupric nitrate solution that you made last week, it means that you excited that cupric ion and you sent its electrons screaming up, giving off energy that reflected a green color to your eyes. Pretty cool, huh? All right, so we have principal quantum number represented by N. 
The next quantum num number getting a little more specific, so again we're going from general to specific, is known as the azimuthal or angular momentum quantum number. It is represented by L. The word azimuth means a course or a bearing, so it's kind of telling us the shape of the pathway that the electron takes, or perhaps the shape of the atomic orbital. We're going to liken this to saying we live in Shreveport. The energy level, the principal quantum number n, was like saying we live in Louisiana, so again we're getting more specific. L may be any integer from zero up to n minus one, and we always start with zero, and then we say n minus one is where we stop. It is dependent upon n. It's dependent, in other words, upon where in relation to the nucleus this course is. So when n equals one, L can only be zero because it can range from zero to one minus one. But let's say n were seven. That means L can be zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six. And the electrons enter that pathway in that order of zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, because they're obeying the Aufbau principle, meaning zero pathway is lower in energy than a one pathway, which is lower in energy than a two pathway, and so on. The next quantum number, getting more specific again, is known as the magnetic quantum number. It is represented by M with a subscript to the right of L. And it describes the orientation of the atomic orbital within three-dimensional space. Again, the orbital is kind of like the house in which the electron would reside, its own little home. So what we are stating is getting more and more specific. We're saying where relative to the nucleus the electron lives, within that distance from the nucleus, what pathway does it take? Within that pathway, what orbital or house does it live in? The m sub l value may range from negative l to positive l. It is dependent upon l, which means within each pathway we have a certain range of what m sub l can be. When n equals 1 and l could only be 0, that meant m sub l could only be 0. But when n equals 2, l can be 0 and it can be 1. Again, we occupy zero as a pathway first because it's lower in energy. And in that pathway we have only one orbital that we can choose to live in, and that would be zero. But in the one pathway, which is higher energy than the zero pathway, we have choices, again, there's an order to it, of having orbitals of M sub L being negative one, zero, or positive one. And that means that there are three orbitals that the electrons can live in within the space of a pathway labeled one. And guys, I know you're just sitting here going, my gosh, this is ridiculous. I don't understand it. It will get better the more you do it. The fourth and most specific quantum number is known as the spin quantum number. It's represented by a lowercase m with a subscript to the right of an s. And as its name implies, it does describe the spin of the electron. I don't know who in quantum number land decided, okay, we're going to really mess with them now. The spin can be negative one half or positive one half. <laughs> it can only be those two. It is dependent upon none of the other quantum numbers. It <laughs> simply is really telling us about the Pauli exclusion principle, the second part, where we said that if two electrons happen to be in an orbital, they have to have opposite spin. That's really what it's obeying. So when I'm in the first energy level, n equals 1, l could only be 0, m sub l could only, could only be 0, it means there was only one pathway and only one orbital, but that one orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. If it holds two electrons, one of the electrons has an m sub s of negative one half, and another of the electrons has an m sub s of positive one half. <laughs> Again, bear with me, it will get easier. You might pause the podcast and 
If you wish to write this stuff down, I don't know if you're taking notes or not, but if you wish to write it down, this is a nice little summary of the four quantum numbers, their names, symbols, and possible values. So what we're going to do is start writing quantum numbers for an electron. And that electron we're going to look at initially is the only electron that hydrogen has. So when we think about it, hydrogen has one electron, it has one proton. That one electron is going to be as close to the nucleus as it can be because it's attracted to it. It's negative, the proton is positive, and actually in the most common isotope of hydrogen, hydrogen 1, there is no neutron. So you only have a proton and an electron. That means that the electron lives as close to the nucleus as it can and n equals 1. Well, if n equals 1, L can only be 0, because L can only range from 0 to 1 minus 1, which means the only choice of pathway that that little electron has is a pathway called a 0 pathway. M sub L, which is telling us in what orbital it might live, can only be 0 as well. And that is because M sub L is dependent upon L. It may range from negative L to positive L. Well, if L can only be 0, then M sub L can only range from negative 0 to positive 0, and that shouldn't make any sense to you. It means that M sub L can only be 0. And because it is, it is only one electron, we are going to give it a spin of negative 1 half. The first electron to enter an orbital, we will give a spin of negative 1 half. So we have put one electron into one orbital, living in the only pathway on the first energy level. Bravo! You've done one set of quantum numbers. So what we're now going to do is look at building quantum numbers. When I teach this in class, I do build this one by one. We do helium next, and then lithium, and then beryllium, and then boron. But I ask you here to give me boron's five electrons. So in class, we would have done all the way up to beryllium and then have boron to do next. But I'm going to go through this with you and explain that we are tracing all five of boron's electrons and where they live. It's like retelling the story over and over when we do quantum numbers because we start at the same spot every time. We start at where hydrogen's one little electron lives, and that's where the first electron of every element will live, in that same spot, as close to the nucleus as it can. That means n equals 1. L has to be 0. M sub L has to be 0. And its spin, M sub S, has to be negative 1 half. But the second of boron's five electrons, when it gets placed into its home, it will also choose to be in the first energy level because the first energy level is not completely filled at this point. Think about it. We have one electron living in an orbital that has a spin of negative one-half. How many electrons can live in an orbital? Two. And what do we know about them? They have to have opposite spin. So if I look at the second electron of boron, it will live in the first energy level, so n will equal one. Because n equals one, l will equal zero because it's the only thing it can be. M sub L will also be zero. Again, it's the only thing it can be. But this time, the second electron of boron will have a spin that is opposite to that of the first electron of boron. So M sub S for the second of boron's electrons will be positive one half. The third of boron's electrons will have to reside in a different energy level than the first and second because the first energy level is now filled. We only had one pathway, it was L equals zero, and L equals zero meant that M sub L could only be zero, which means we only have one orbital, and one orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. So that translates into the first energy level only being able to hold two electrons. Once we fill the first energy level and move into the second energy level, we kind of start over. So the third of boron's five electrons will go into the second energy level, N equals two. L may range from 0 to n minus 1. Now we have to look at it a little differently. That means L may be 0 or L may be 1. Well, L 
equals zero is a lower energy state than L equals one. So it will fill L equals one first. When L equals one, M sub L may also only be, I misspoke, when L equals zero, M sub L may also only be zero because M sub L ranges from zero, negative, <laughs> to zero, positive. Again, no such thing, so it can only be zero. It's the first electron to be placed in this new orbital of this new pathway in the second energy level. So it will have a spin of negative one half. If I look at the fourth of boron's five electrons, it will also go into the second energy level. Again, the first energy level is filled. It has two electrons in it. The second energy level is not yet filled. So N equals two for that fourth of boron's five electrons. When N equals two, L may be zero or one. Have we filled L equals zero with its maximum number of electrons? Your answer should be no. We have a negative one half spinning electron and an M sub L of zero within L equals zero pathway. So we are going to have for the fourth electron of boron, N equals two, L equals zero, because L equals zero, M sub L will also be zero, and M sub S will be positive one half. Now think about that. We have a pathway, L equals zero in the second energy level. One orbital, M sub L equals zero, and it's holding two electrons. One spins negative one half, one spins positive one half. Now we have to move into a different pathway. So the fifth electron of boron will indeed live in the second energy level, but notice, we have occupied the maximum space in L equals zero. So this time we have to choose L equals one. We've gone up in energy. That means that if L equals one, M sub L may be negative L to positive L inclusive of zero every time. That means it can be negative one, zero, or positive one. Negative values are filled before the zero, which are filled before the positive values. So we're going to say M sub L for this fifth electron of boron equals negative one. M sub S, because it's the first electron going into this particular orbital within this particular pathway, will be negative one half. So now that I've gone over all of that orally, I want to show you what this looks like. So as you see on this slide, I've reflected in order from left to right, the five electrons of boron and where they live down to their spins. Okay, now in class, I will continue to go all the way across to neon. And I will discuss more about looking at a periodic table. However, it's very hard for me to do so without pointing out on a periodic table to you. And since I'm not doing a vodcast here, it's a little hard for me to do so. So rest assured that in class, I will cover all the way to neon and it's 10 electrons and stating where they live. What I'm gonna ask you to do next within this podcast then is tell me the four quantum numbers of sodium's valence electron. By this point, I will have talked about valence electrons in class the outermost electrons, as I did in this podcast, and allow you to understand that when you look at the periodic table, group one, the first column, elements will have one valence electron. Group two elements, which is the second column, will have two valence electrons. Group 13, which is the column headed by boron, Notice we skipped all those metals in the middle. Those are called transition metals. So group 13 will have three valence electrons. Group 14, headed by carbon, will have four valence electrons. Group 15, headed by nitrogen, will have five valence electrons. Group 16, headed by oxygen, will have six valence electrons. Group 17, headed by fluorine, will have seven valence electrons. And group 18 will have eight valence electrons except for helium which has two valence electrons. They're known as noble gases because they have stable outermost electron energy levels. And helium is stable with two in that first energy level. All right, so 
Again, I would have traced all the way through neon's 10 electrons. We are looking at the 11th electron of sodium here. So I'm asking you to give me four quantum numbers for sodium's 11th electron. Well, the 11th electron means that it will occupy the third energy level. So N will equal three. And it does so because two of its 11 electrons are in the first energy level. Eight of its 11 electrons are in the second energy level and eight electrons happens to fill the second energy level. That's why neon is happy, because that's a total of 10 electrons. So sodium's 11th electron goes into the third energy level. Because it goes into the third energy level, N equals three, and L may range from zero to one to two. Think about which will be occupied first, the zero pathway, the one pathway, or the two pathway. I hope that you said the zero pathway. It's lower in energy than the one, which is lower in energy than the two. So if L equals zero, then M sub L can range from negative L to positive L, and that means M sub L will also equal zero. And it is the first electron to occupy this M sub L of zero, therefore it has an M sub S of negative one half. Again, check this slide make sure you've written it properly. Okay, I will do more with quantum numbers in class. I know it's frustrating if you're not a student of mine to listen to this and not quite get all of it, but this is one of those where it really takes my, my being there showing you, pointing to things. So what we're gonna get into next is another way of describing where electrons reside within an atom. It's a method that if you've taken physical science, you possibly have been introduced to before, and it's known as electron configurations. It's like speaking a different language of where electrons live. Quantum numbers was a numerical way of stating where they live. Electron configurations is kind of a number and letter and exponent kind of looking thing, way of describing where electrons live. They are not quite as specific as quantum numbers are because they will give us the energy level, the atomic orbital, and the number of electrons residing in that orbital and in that energy level, but they will not give us the spin. So that's the benefit to quantum numbers. They do tell us spin. The energy level for an electron configuration can be any positive integer. It is the same thing as the principal quantum number or the n value. So one, means first energy level, two means second energy level, three means third energy level, and the numbers are telling us respectively we're getting farther and farther away from the nucleus. The next thing that an electron configuration will tell us is the atomic orbital, or what is oftentimes referred to as the sublevel. It's represented by lowercase letters S, P, D, and F, and what it translates are both the azimuthal and magnetic quantum number. It essentially translates the azimuthal and the magnetic quantum number. S in electron configuration is the same as when L equals zero. It's lower energy pathway. P is the same as when L equals one. It's just higher in energy than an S pathway. D is the same as when L equals two, and it's just higher in energy than a P pathway. And F, it's the same as when L equals three, and you got it, it's just higher in energy than a D pathway. When L gets bigger than three, <laughs> this gets a little tricky, we do just follow the alphabet, by the way, so that with L equals four, the atomic orbital or sublevel letter would be G. When we get back to P and S, we kind of have to do a little glitchy stuff, so don't worry about it, we're not getting that high. And as I said, the electron configuration shows the number of electrons. It'll show us either a number of electrons in an atomic orbital or in the sublevel. In the S sublevel, which remember was L equals zero, there will be a maximum of two electrons. In the P sublevel, there will be a maximum of six electrons. That was when L equals one. 
when L equals 3, it's a D sublevel, and there will be a maximum of 10 electrons. And in the F sublevel, when L equals 3, a maximum of 14 electrons. It doesn't mean we always have to have the maximum in there, but it means we can't have more than that. So, you will be using a periodic table to guide you in writing electron configurations. When I learned this method in high school, I was given this little schematic thing with arrows and 1s and 2s and 2p and 3s and 3p and 3d kind of stuff on it and told to follow the arrows and had no rhyme or reason to it. And boy, I tell you, it was an aha experience when I figured out that, my gosh, the periodic table really, really makes sense. So, I aim to teach you things that make sense to you. I want you to study a periodic table for a few moments. Turn the podcast off and just look at a periodic table. Think about the numbers 2, 6, 10, and 14. And think about the literal physical arrangement to the periodic table. Don't look at the numbers that are on the periodic table. Don't look at the atomic numbers or the average atomic masses. I'm talking about looking at the physical arrangement of the periodic table and thinking about what the four numbers 2, 6, 10, and 14 have to do with the shape of the periodic table or the arrangement of it. Okay, if you stop that podcast and you've thought about it and you're racking your brain, you just can't get it, well, I'll spoil it for you. Alrighty, if you are looking at a periodic table and you look at the two leftmost groups, again, groups are columns on a periodic table, the two leftmost groups reflect for us the S sublevel, meaning every element in groups one and two will end its electron configuration with an S sublevel. To be a little more specific, everyone in group one will have one electron in an S sublevel, and everyone in group two will have two electrons in an S sublevel. If you look over to groups 13 through 18, those are headed by boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and we're gonna say neon. We're gonna kind of for the moment put helium over above beryllium. I'll make that make a little more sense in just a moment. Those six groups, oh my gosh, is it working out yet? Uh-huh. Those six groups reflect ending electron configurations with a P sublevel. Again, more specifically, those in group 13 will end their electron configurations with one in a P sublevel, and group 14 with two in a P sublevel. When group 15 with three in a P sublevel, group 16, you got it, four in a P sublevel, group 17, five in a P sublevel, and group 18, yep, you got it, six in a P sublevel. Anybody find the 10 reference yet? Mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. Look down at the transition metals. Those are headed by. Uh, the columns are headed by scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc. There happen to be oh, 10 groups. Oh my gosh. Is it working in your brain yet? And I bet you guessed it. They're all going to end their electron configurations with Ds. And going across those 10 groups, it'd be one in the D, two in the D, three in the D, and so on and so on and so on. And the Fs, my gosh, what's left on the periodic table. Oh, yep, you got that stuff that's pulled out down at the bottom that are headed by cerium, praseodymium, neodymium, promethium, samarium, europium, gadolinium, terbium, dysprosium, holmium, erbium, tulium, ytterbium, and lutetium. Hmm, are there 14 groups there? There are. Yep, they'll end their electron configurations with F, and you got it. Cerium will end its electron configuration with F and one electron in it. Lutetium will end its electron configuration with F and 14 in it. My gosh, it just gets better and better. I know, you can barely contain yourself. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is look at how quantum numbers and electron configurations work together. So I'm gonna ask you to write the four quantum numbers of hydrogen's one electron. 
When you do so, think about the fact that you wrote N equals L equals M sub L equals and M sub S equals. So you should have N equals 1, L equals 0, M sub L equals 0, and M sub S equals negative 1 half. Alrighty, so on this slide, you see that I have those quantum numbers reflected, but I also have this business of electron configuration. And notice, it is read from left to right. This one is a palindrome, but it is always read from left to right, giving us the energy level, then the sublevel or orbital, and then the number of electrons as a superscript to the right. So I read the electron configuration of hydrogen as 1s1. Now something we don't do in quantum numbers is consolidate because we traced where every electron of every atom went. Well, what we're going to do is write the electron configurations of helium through neon, and I'm going to have you look at a periodic table and go through this with me, and then I'll take you to the next slide that shows the result of helium, lithium, beryllium, and boron. We'll do those four, check them, and then do the next. So, if I look at a periodic table, and I've told you to, in your mind's eye, put helium over above beryllium, that means that helium should end its electron configuration in S, and it should have two electrons in there. And take a guess at which energy level those two electrons of helium live in. I hope you guessed the first energy level. So I'm about to freak you out even more. The periods, the rows on the periodic table, are called periods. For the S elements and the P elements, meaning those that end in S and P, the period number directly tells you the energy level number. It is so cool. So because helium is on the first period, its electron configuration will be 1s2. Again, reading from left to right. 1 tells us the energy level, s is the sublevel or orbital, and the superscript to the right of 2 tells us that there are two electrons living in the s orbital of the first energy level. When my eyes are drawn to lithium, notice I'm now on the second energy level. And it has a total of three electrons. But I'm going to trace where all three live, and I'm going to consolidate like terms where I can. So what I do is start at hydrogen every time and let my eyes go back and forth across, or forth and back, rather, across the periodic table until I get to the element that I'm writing the electron configuration of. So I have lithium with three electrons, my eyes go, hmm, hydrogen to helium was 1s2. My eyes are drawn to lithium. It's on the second period, so it's going to be 2 for its energy level number, but it's in the s block, so it'll be s, and it's in the first of the s block groups, so it'll end it with a superscript of 1. So it's read as 1s2, 2s1. Beryllium, four electrons total. The first two live in the same place as lithium's first two and helium's first two, or only two. So it's 1s2. And I've got to account for two more electrons. They happen to live in the s orbital of the second energy level. Because remember, two electrons can occupy an orbital. So beryllium is 1s2, 2s2. And then boron, which has five electrons, 1s2, that should take you through helium. Your eyes should be drawn to helium with 1s2. 2s2, your eyes should be drawn to beryllium, but you're going to boron. So then boron is the beginning of the p sublevel, which means it'll be in the second energy level, but a p sublevel, so it'll end in 2p1. Now take a look at this slide. Look at how I have them written for you. And look at the sum of the superscripts for each element. Helium shouldn't be a hard sum to get since there is no sum, it's two. For lithium, it's three. For beryllium, it's four. And for boron, hmm, it's five. What does that have to do with anything? You should have realized that that is telling us the total number of electrons in the atom. 
So your sum of your superscripts will always give you the total number of electrons. We're going to continue across to neon. I'll do them orally and then pop the slide up that shows you their resulting electron configurations. So carbon has a total of six electrons. The first two go into the 1s. The second two go into the 2s. And the next two go into the 2p. So you should have 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Nitrogen, total of seven electrons. 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. Oxygen, total of excuse me, eight electrons. 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Fluorine, a total of nine electrons. 1s2, 2s2, 2p5. And neon, a total of, you got it, 10 electrons. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And notice neon is a member of what's known as the noble gases. It is noble because it has the maximum number of electrons that it can have at that point in its second energy level, and that is eight. So take a look at the slide, check your electron configurations, make sure you're writing them properly, and then I'll go into what are known as shorthand electron configurations. Because I imagine you can understand that if I continued in the manner in which I'm doing this, my gosh, if I were to write radon's electron configuration, I'd be there for a while writing all this 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, blah, 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 stuff. So we have a shorthand way of doing it. In the shorthand way, you're assuming that you are so good, you don't have to provide the entirety of the electron configuration. You can let everyone know that you know the electron configuration up to the noble gas that precedes the element whose configuration you're writing, and that all you really care about are the valence electrons, those that are the outermost energy level electrons. So a shorthand electron configuration shows us very clearly valence electrons and makes an assumption that we understand everything up to the valence electrons. Now, there comes a time when it's stupid to do an electron configuration in shorthand because you're actually not saving yourself any time. So I'm going to show you on these next slides doing shorthand electron configurations for the ones we've already done, but you're going to see that it really isn't any shorter. So we really don't tend to do shorthand electron configurations until we get past neon, by the way. Uh, it's, not, it's just not advantageous. But if you look at this slide, I've given you the shorthand electron configuration for helium through carbon, and helium's shorthand electron configuration is 1s2. I can't just put helium down. Nope. But you see that for lithium, I have written something rather different than what you saw earlier. I put the symbol for helium in brackets. And what I'm doing there is saying, yeah, I'm good, I'm tough. I know that the electron configuration up through helium is 1s2, and I don't have to write that. But, a wise soul that you are, notice you just wrote more in writing HE and the brackets than you did in writing 1S2, so you didn't save yourself any time. Again, this doesn't become very useful until we get past neon. But take a look at these, you have helium, I'm going to read it not as HE brackets 2S1, I'm going to say helium 2S1, beryllium helium 2S2, boron is helium 2S2, 2P1, and carbon is helium. 2s2, 2p2. Now, what it's done is truly isolated the valence electrons. If you look at that, lithium, the only electron superscript business you're looking at is the one electron that lives in the 2s. And what that's screaming at you is lithium has one valence electron. Beryllium has two valence electrons. Boron has a total of three valence electrons. You hear Lyndon talking in the background because he thinks I'm talking to him. So he's just going, wow, wow. Carbon has a total of four valence electrons. He's getting closer. He's going to get louder, by the way. He's a needy soul. He just woke up. Okay. On this next slide, 
you will see the shorthand electron configurations for nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. Again, it's not really helpful to do shorthand electron configuration until you get past neon. So, nitrogen, HE, 2S2, 2P3, oxygen, HE, 2S2, 2P4, fluorine, HE, 2S2, 2P5, and neon, HE, 2S2, 2P6. Check those valence electrons again. It's pretty magical, isn't it? Nitrogen has five, oxygen six, fluorine seven, neon eight. I'm telling you, this periodic table is just magical. Okay, so now we're gonna do a few more and we are going to look at doing shorthand electron configurations. Do not write a longhand electron configuration unless I specifically ask you to do so, by the way. It's just too tedious. So, I'm gonna ask you to write electron configurations in shorthand for sodium, silicon, chlorine, and argon. And if you'll stop the podcast, give yourself a little time to do that, come back and check the next slide, I'll show you what you should have ended up with. Alrighty, if you are back or if you were too wimpy to stop it and you just need to keep being spoon-fed, here you go. Sodium, N-E, in the brackets, 3S1. What it's saying is I don't have to write the electron configuration for anything other than the valence electrons. So I go to the noble gas that precedes sodium. Well, gee, that happens to be neon. So I put its symbol in brackets and then only write the electron configuration for what comes after it. Well, as I look at sodium on the periodic table, it's in the third period. It's in the first group. So 3S1. Look at silicon. Go all the way across to silicon from sodium. We didn't do magnesium or aluminum. I'm not going to do every one of these. That just gets a little old. We need to learn to jump around. You have neon's symbol in brackets and then 3S2, 3P2. For chlorine, NE, 3S2, 3P5. For argon, NE, 3S2, 3P6. You should be able to tell me how many valence electrons each of these has. Sodium 1, silicon 4, chlorine 7, argon 8. What's that make argon? Makes it happy, snotty, noble. Let's look at the next four you will do. Calcium, scandium, manganese, and selenium. Yep, we're getting into some goofier looking ones. So again, stop it, come back to it. Calcium, the noble gas that precedes it, is argon. So I put AR in brackets and then 4S2. Scandium also has argon preceding it, but notice it is entering the D sublevel. So I again trace from the noble gas preceding it. So my eyes go to argon, I write down its symbol, put it in brackets, and then I'm working my way to scandium, but I have to go through 4S first. And what that tells me is that 4S is lower in energy than what comes after it. And what comes after it is a D sublevel. But this is where it gets a little more befuddling. D sublevels are always in energy levels that are one less than their period number, which means scandium will put its very last electron into the 3D sublevel. Again, D sublevels are always one less than the period number on which they reside. If you look at a periodic table, that means scandium is the beginning of 3D, Yttrium is the beginning of 4D, Lanthanum is the beginning of 5D, and Actinium is the beginning of 6D. Look at manganese, you're going across the periodic table, and all you're doing is counting within each of these little sublevels. So manganese's noble gas that precedes it is again argon. You have AR in brackets, 4S2 takes you through calcium. Let your eyes drag all the way to manganese, and you count over how many pl places, you count over five places, so it should be argon in brackets, 4S2, 3D5. Then selenium. Notice selenium is over in the P sublevel. So what that means is we have to go all the way across to selenium and state where all of the electrons live. Argon precedes it, AR in brackets, 4S2 takes you through calcium. 3D10, I shouldn't even have to count over because I know that the D's maximum number is 10 and I know that I'll be at 3D10 when I get to zinc, and I have to go through zinc and beyond to get to selenium. So then once I get to the 
P sublevel, I count over to selenium and it's four places, four groups. So the configuration is AR, 4S2, 3D10, 4P, 4. Alrighty, the next four I want you to try are iodine, lanthanum, cerium, and mercury. Again, stop it if you have the guts to. <laughs> and come back to it and I'll tell you what you should have gotten. Again, were you gutless or were you gutful? Oh well, doesn't matter at this point. You just keep on rolling with it. So iodine, noble gas that precedes it is krypton, KR in brackets. Again, let your eyes go all the way across to iodine. So we start with 5S2. That takes you through, um, I'm sorry, I <laughs> had difficulty looking. That takes you through strontium. 4D10 takes you through cadmium. And then all the way over to iodine, count over five times, so it ends in 5P5. Lanthanum, noble gas preceding it, is xenon, so you put Xe in brackets. And then 6S2 takes you through barium. 5D1 takes you to lanthanum. Now look at how goofy cerium is, and you'll find a lot of different ways to do this, by the way. I'm teaching you one method. There are lots of different thoughts on this, so we just kind of... <laughs> Do cross our fingers and hope for, for good luck on, on these goofier ones down here. So cerium really lives in the sixth period, by the way. The periodic table would be about twice as wide as it is if we were to put cerium through lutetium where it belongs in period six and thorium through lawrencium where it belongs in period seven. So I need you to understand that they really do live in those periods. And what that means is to do cerium's electron configuration, xenon is a noble gas preceding it. So I put Xe in brackets and then 6s2. 5d1 takes me through lanthanum because it's atomic number 57, which precedes atomic number 58, cerium. And then cerium is the beginning of 4f because the f's will be two less than their period number. Again, f sublevel will always be two less than their period number. So cerium is the beginning of 4F, and thorium is the beginning of 5F. So because we're looking at cerium, we only put one into the 4F. And therefore you see it is Xe in brackets, 6S2, 5D1, 4F1. Alrighty, and then I asked you to do mercury. Mercury is also on that sixth period. Xenon is preceding it. So Xe in brackets, 6S2 takes you through barium. Notice I did not write 5D1 to get us into lanthanum because I'm combining like terms. What happens is I put 1 into 5D for lanthanum and I tell it, hold on just a minute, I'll be back when I finish the four Fs. And notice to get to mercury, I have to finish the four Fs. So I'm going to go from cerium over to lutetium. I shouldn't even have to count. I know that they can hold a maximum of 14. So I then write 4F14. I come back and I continue in the 5Ds and count all the way over to Mercury, so it's a total of 10 in 5D. So Xe in brackets, 6S2, 4F14, 5D10. Alrighty, there are four electron configurations that I teach you as exceptions. They're not the only elements that have exceptional configurations, but these are four that are pretty logical and pretty easy for you to figure. I want you to go ahead and write the shorthand electron configurations for chromium, copper, molybdenum, and silver. And then I want you to realize, hmm, they're wrong, because we're going to fix them. If you will pause as you write them, come back, which I know you won't do, take a look at this slide, you will see that I've crossed out what you wrote as the electron configurations for each of those. What goes on is the most stable that a sublevel can be is when it is filled. The next most stable is when it is half filled, and the next most stable is when it is empty. Anything other than those three situations is not preferable. So when you look at chromium's electron configuration that you hopefully wrote as AR in brackets 4S2 3D4, the S is filled. It can hold a maximum of two electrons. The D with four electrons is not filled, it's not half filled, and it's not empty. 
But gee, if I were able to give it a little extra energy, just energy that's, that's present, ambient energy is what it's known as, and boost one of those S electrons up into the higher energy D sublevel, wouldn't I be left with one in the S and five in the D? And that happens to make each of them half filled, which is a much more stable situation than having 4s2, 3d4. So the accepted electron configuration for chromium is AR in brackets, 4s1, 3d5. Look at copper, you had AR, 4s2, 3d9, I hope. It's more stable if I boost an S electron into the D sublevel and make it AR in brackets, 4s1, 3d10. Notice I did similar things with molybdenum and silver. Now, you might be asking, well, gee, why don't tungsten and gold do it? Why aren't you giving us those? Realize that you have an F sublevel that's in the way. They would have to jump not just into the D sublevel, but over the F sublevel. Think of it as rungs of a ladder that they have to climb in order, alpha principle. Alrighty, the last little bit that I'm showing you is known as an orbital diagram. And when you see an orbital diagram, it does an amazing job of showing you the electron configuration, illustrating the Aufbau principle, the Pauli exclusion principle, and Hund's rule. We end up, again, kind of looking at it as climbing rungs of a ladder. So we will have energy on our y-axis. We're going to climb up a ladder, so we're going to have energy increasing along our y-axis. We're going to have little lines that we use, horizontal lines, going up like rungs of a ladder to represent orbitals. Remember I told you those are like the homes for the electrons. And orbital diagrams go a step further than electron configurations and are right up there with quantum numbers as far as the level of information they provide because they also show us the spin of the electrons. And we use arrows, an up arrow or a down arrow, to indicate spin. Now, I don't know that anyone is so particular as to say that a down arrow corresponds to the negative one-half spin and an up arrow corresponds to the positive one-half spin. I'm not going to be a stickler on that. Just be consistent with it. I seem to recall when I built this that I did the up arrow first. So if that bothers you, just deal with it. All righty. What you see on the next slide is known as a template for orbital diagrams. And what you see is energy increasing along a y-axis. And I'm showing the orbitals as these lines with their orbital names beneath them. So you see that 1s is lower in energy than 2s. And 2s is lower in energy than 2p. And there happen to be three orbitals in 2p. In quantum numbers, they're labeled as m sub l equals negative 1, 0, and positive 1. In orbital diagrams, they're labeled as x, y, and z because there's a p orbital on the x-axis, a p orbital on a y-axis, and a p orbital on the z-axis within three-dimensional space. Just higher in energy than the two p orbitals that notice are at equal energy with each other will be the 3s orbital which is just lower in energy than the 3p orbitals. Again, there are three of those because every orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons and a p sublevel can hold a maximum of six electrons. Therefore, it has to have three orbitals. So that's your template. What I'm going to show you is orbital diagram for several atoms. We're going to start with hydrogen. So if you'll look at this slide, you see that I've taken the template and I didn't eradicate the empty orbitals. You can if you wish to. So that all that you would really have to represent for the orbital diagram of H is what you see at the very bottom, the 1s orbital with one arrow in it. Again, I did make this an upward pointing arrow as my first one if that confuses you. Just don't relate it to the negative one half, positive one half thing. Don't think negative is down and positive is up. Again, in class, it's a little easier for me to show you that I can just write this with the energy shown on the y-axis and the 1s orbital with one electron in it. 
The next slide you see shows you the orbital diagram for helium. Again, too much empty space up there. I would normally not have the whole template shown if I were just writing the orbital diagram for helium. But notice there's another electron in the 1s orbital and it happens to be, you got it, oppositely spinning. So it's an oppositely turned arrow. I did beryllium on this slide. Beryllium has a total of four electrons. The first two enter the 1s orbital. Can't have more than two electrons in an orbital. So they then go into the next higher energy orbital, which is 2s. Two electrons can fit in there. So beryllium has two electrons in the 1s and two electrons in the 2s. And I bet you that you can look at your electron configuration for beryllium and see that. Next one that I did is carbon. Now, you notice something is a little different here. Carbon has a total of six electrons. The first two go into the 1s. The next two go into the 2s. The next two do go into the 2p, but this is where we can definitely elucidate Hund's rule, which is the one that was so bizarre when I first introduced it to you, that electrons occupying equal energy orbitals will fill with parallel spins first and then come back and do the opposite spins. We saw it in quantum numbers when I did it in class. Didn't necessarily see it with what I did on this podcast and in this PowerPoint, but what I do in class, you saw it. So those last two electrons of carbon are not both going to go into 2px orbital. They're going to be parallel spinning, meaning spinning in the same direction, in this case it's two up arrows, in equal energy orbitals. So I put them in 2px and 2py. That plays a significant role in how carbon ends up bonding. A little bit later we'll talk about it. The next one that I did is oxygen. It has eight total electrons. So notice the first two went into 2s, the next two into, excuse me, <laughs> I misspoke. The first two went into 1s, the next two into 2s. Then we have four electrons remaining. If you didn't obey Hund's rule, you would have put two into 2px and two into 2py. But nope, how did I do it? One into 2px, one into 2py, and one into 2pz. And then the fourth one, back into 2px with an opposite spin. And what that, I'm, it, it's just the beauty of this, it shows me, I look at it and I say, how many unpaired electrons do you have in oxygen? And you should immediately be able to tell me two. You see two arrows that don't have a partner. So that means there are two unpaired electrons in oxygen. The next one I did is phosphorus. Take a look at it. Yep, I'm just tracing its electron configuration up. Notice it ends in 3p3. That means I have one in 3px, one in 3py, and one in 3pz. Okay, boy, this is a long one, isn't it? Told you, it's big bad stuff. As a wrap up, I asked my students in class to write the four quantum numbers for each of nitrogen's seven electrons, and then to write the electron configuration for nitrogen in long hand, and then to write the orbital diagram for nitrogen. And boy, it's neat how they all work together. And the three methods, quantum numbers, electron configurations, and orbital diagrams, just really reiterate where electrons live. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you can come back and listen to it bit by bit and grasp it a little better. I tell my students it gets better with time as pretty much any educational concept does. Just give it time. It's a hard concept. It will get embedded in your brain and be understood by you at some point. It will. Alrighty. You have a great day. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>